Good morning, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this year's 2021 Connecticut Mentoring Summit, Advancing Social Equity in Youth Mentoring. We're so glad that uh, we are looking forward to a, a very energizing two days for this summit. Uh, my name is Roland Harmon, uh, co-president here at the Governor's Prevention Partnership. And we're expecting over 170 attendees over our two day uh, journey together, our time together. Uh, and we've got over 40 presenters and speakers lined up. I tell you, this has just been an all hands on deck effort here in Connecticut with mentoring practitioners, with experts, with mentors. We have such a diverse audience joining us today to really hone in and talk about advancing mentoring here in Connecticut uh, through a social equity lens. And I've known, uh, I have seen firsthand the power of mentoring and the benefits of mentoring relationships when a caring adult takes the time to impart wisdom, provide support, encouragement, and guidance to our young people and to families all across Connecticut. Um, I've, I've had the benefit of having a mentor and or mentors in my life uh, since high school. And these were adults, whether they were at school, uh, at church, some of them were aunts and uncles, and, and I've been blessed to serve as a mentor myself. I've learned a lot. Uh, and my time at the partnership, I've seen the evolution of mentoring, um, whether that is a, a school-based mentoring model, uh, a mentor who, who is supporting young people at school in the community. Uh, the evolution goes on to uh, strength and mentoring services to support youth who are involved in systems, whether that's in juvenile justice or, or foster care. Uh, and so, so much has been happening in the world of mentoring. There is a national mentoring movement and we're so glad Connecticut is part of this. And this is why mentoring is more important now than ever before. We, we recognize the time that we're in. Um, youth in some cases are shuttered in their homes, they're disconnected. Uh, unfortunately, they're dis dis disengaged from their peers, from schools. Uh, and mentors can play a critical role in helping young people navigate during this dreadful pandemic. And, and they also provide some sense of normalcy, uh, connection. They also serve as a listening ear for young people to express themselves so they can feel as though they, they have an outlet to discuss what's happening all around them. And that's why this summit is important today. And we've heard many stories from practitioners all around the state with what's happening, uh, but we've come together. We've come together to plan and to have this day and be able to discuss what's working. And we wanna thank all those involved today, all of our partners uh, for their participation and involvement in today's summit. So over these next two days, <laughs> We're gonna be looking at different challenges, opportunities, innovations in mentoring, uh, geared towards advancing social justice and equity. Uh, we brought together, again, some of the great leaders in mentoring across Connecticut, also across our country. We got them here with us today. And we're so glad that you're here this morning to get things kicked off right at the top of the hour. Uh, today, we're gonna to be hearing from legislators representing districts across our state discussing their experiences and, and, and hopes for mentoring in 2021 and beyond. We're all working together. We're also honoring some great leaders who have helped shape mentoring in Connecticut over the years. And we'll also talk about building youth power through mentoring. Uh, and that's gonna be part of our keynote presentation today. So we've got some great workshops coming up this afternoon. Uh, you can see those on your screen now, uh, and the workshops run concurrently in different Zoom rooms. Um, feel free to pop in and out of those rooms as, as you choose. Uh, and we'll be finishing today uh, in the afternoon uh, with an exciting new technology, some exciting new technology in the field of mentoring. So as you can see, there, there is a full agenda for the day. Uh, and uh, all the rooms that are available uh, are on the website, on our website uh, for day one. You can find them at preventionworksct.org forward slash day one. Uh, we've also emailed all the links uh, to all the registrants this morning. 
And if you have any issues uh, with connecting with any of the, 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 the workshops or throughout the day, please feel free to direct your questions to any one of our staff. So during the summit today, we're going to be examining uh, through the lens of our current numbers. Uh, and you've got some numbers before you. In 2019, as a, let me just back up a little bit. As a state mentoring partnership, part of the national mentoring movement, uh, we are connected to Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, which is the national organization that kind of guides the movement of mentoring here in the state. And we're the state affiliate at the Governor's Prevention Partnership. And part of the charge of the state affiliate is to just do a pulse and a check in on mentoring programs. And so we try to do this every two years, every two to three years. And in 2019, that was our last survey. Um, and you can see here, uh, we found that about 10,000 youth, young people in Connecticut, our current were our match with mentors. And I know 10,000 feel, may feel like a, a, a big number, but in a state with more than 645,000 young people between the ages of five and 19, uh, according to state estimates, um, this data actually underscores how many more mentors we need uh, in our state. Uh, and to that, then to add to that, uh, this year, uh, you know, we've been through COVID, social unrest, the violence at the Capitol and so on, uh, Connecticut's young people have never needed mentoring more now than ever. Um, our next slide, uh, you'll see that mentoring programs uh, that we talk to every day constantly tell us, you know, through trainings, through convening forums and, and summits like this and conferences, uh, you'll see that, you know, they need mentors. Uh, and more uh, dollars allocated uh, to support mentoring programs. You can see right here in the numbers from the 2019 survey. But so, so there is good news. Um, and on, on our next slide, you'll see the, the diversity of mentoring programs across the state. Um, we could just go ahead to the next section here. You'll see the diversity of mentoring programs across the state. Uh, the bulk of mentoring programs are one-on-one -on -one relationships. That's very well represented here in Connecticut, followed by um, uh, group mentoring and a combined blended approach uh, between group and individual mentoring. Uh, and again, this is data programs. This is what you shared with us. Uh, and we were able to take this and kind of uh, make, some, make some assessments on what, what Connecticut looks like in terms of a snapshot for mentoring. Um, and this year we have expanded uh, virtual mentoring opportunities. You'll see that that's a small sliver back in 2019, but we know that that has increased significantly uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, and so we know that a lot of programs are now engaged in virtual mentoring to keep students and young people connected during this time. So with that, um, so much of our funding, uh, remember that was one of the highlights and needs of programs, but so much of our funding to keep mentoring programs running in Connecticut does come from uh, federal agencies, from the federal government, which will bring us now to uh, our guest speaker, uh, Natalie Joseph, uh, who is with the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Uh, we're very glad to have her here with us today. She currently serves as the Partnerships uh, Grants Manager uh, for one of our uh, current grants. We actually have two grants with OJJDP. Uh, and, and we've been involved with OJJDP since 2012. We've received funding to uh, build program capacity, develop tools and resources for the field. Uh, this particular project that, that Natalie serves as the Grants Manager for uh, that we have from 2016, a project to strengthen and enhance youth initiated mentoring practices across our state. And this is where young people can identify mentors for themselves. Um, and then our current project that we have with OJJDP, we're focusing on uh, increasing mentoring opportunities for youth impacted by opioids. So we're very glad to have Natalie with us. Natalie, thank you for being with us and welcome to our summit. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everybody, mentoring providers, educators, policymakers, and mentors. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Connecticut Mentoring Summit. Again, I am Natalie. I'm the program manager at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, also known as OJJDP. 
And first off, I would definitely like to thank Governor's Prevention Partnerships for coordinating this mentoring summit and the work that you're doing with the mentoring opportunities for youth for youth initiative, specifically the mentoring NOW and the New Haven Mentoring NIAI. And 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 if they come in contact with the justice system, the contact should be both just and beneficial to them. Our mission is to provide national leadership, coordination, and resources to prevent and respond to juvenile delinquency and victimization. OJJDP supports the efforts of states, tribes, and communities to develop and implement effective and equitable juvenile justice systems that enhance public safety, ensure youth are held appropriately accountable for both crime and for both crime victims and communities, and to empower youth to live law-abiding lives. OJJDP has long supported mentoring programs. We have awarded over one billion dollars in mentor for mentoring organizations from FY 2008 to FY 2020. And OJJDP's mentoring work aims to both increase opportunities for youth to have mentors and to improve the quality and impact of the mentoring they do receive. Because mentoring has been shown to improve self-esteem, academic achievement, peer relationships, reduce drug use, aggression, depressive symptoms, and delinquent acts. And to that end, I would just like to mention that OJJDP is currently accepting applications for the National Mentoring Program, the Multi-State Mentoring Program Initiative, and the Mentoring for Youth Affected by Opioid Crisis and Drug Addiction, amongst other programs. And just a little background on the three programs that I just mentioned. The National Mentoring Program provides funding for organizations to enhance and expand mentoring services for children and youth. The Multi-State Mentoring Program Initiative supports the implementation and delivery of mentoring services to youth populations that are at risk for juvenile delinquency and the just juvenile justice system. The Mentoring for Youth Affected by Opioid Crisis and Drug Addiction supports the implementation, delivery, of mentoring services to youth who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs, youth at risk for abusing drugs, and youth with family members who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs. You can visit our website for additional information on eligibility. Um, and that website is www.ojjdp.ojp.gov. And finally, as we gather to discuss evidence-based approaches to the design, implementation, and evaluation of youth mentoring and how mentoring and innovative use of new tools and technologies empower our youth, I would like to mention that OJJD, OJJDP has a National Mentoring Resource Center, also known as NMRC, and that center is geared to improve the quality and effectiveness of youth mentoring across the country through increased use of evidence-based practices and sharing practitioner innovations. And the center does offer no cost training and technical assistance for organizations for their youth mentoring programs, whether you're funded by OJJDP or not. So I encourage you mentoring organizations to definitely utilize that resource. You can visit the website and that is www.nationalmentoringresourcecenter.org for additional information. And again, welcome to the 2021 Connecticut Mentoring Summit, and I wish everyone a fruitful summit experience. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the partnership's co-president, Kelly Jolson Scopino. Kelly is a former legislator and will be monitoring, moderating this morning's legislative roundtable. Kelly, good morning. Good morning, Natalie. Yeah, Thank you so much for being here with us today. We're so excited to have you. Um, from DC, I could make a really lame joke about thanks for flying here. We know your arms are tired, but during COVID, you know, <laughs> that applies. So uh, this was certainly our good fortune that you were able to be here with us this morning. And uh, as Natalie said, I am Kelly Jolson Scapino. I am the other co-president of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. And I'm just so here, so glad to be here with you all today um, for the legislative roundtable to talk about the state of mentoring in Connecticut. 
uh, we at the partnership are a public-private partnership, and so we operate with both the support of government and private business. And uh, we have the trifecta here with the state, federal, and private support. And I'm thrilled to be here to lead this next section of our conversation, the Legislative Roundtable, the State of Mentoring in Connecticut. We really wanted to use this opportunity to bring legislators and mentoring leaders together to hear from each other and have a conversation about the importance of mentoring. Here at the partnership, we're fortunate to work with mentoring programs from every corner of the state, many of whom are here today. Uh, we have T from Northeastern Connecticut. We work with the Stanford Public Education Fund. We work with Klingberg in New Britain. And then of course my friends at the Manchester Youth Service Bureau and everywhere in between. We all know that mentoring is such an effective strategy to help young people stay on track, achieve in school and in life. And Roland shared earlier today that mentoring recruitment was the top issue that's been identified by our mentoring programs from across the state. And our co-chair of our organization, Governor Led Lamont, put mentoring on the map back in early December when he opted to include mentoring as a volunteer opportunity for people in our state to help during the COVID-19 crisis. So to date, um, since that was launched, we have been able to recruit 30 additional mentors to the mentoring movement here in Connecticut. And we've made a commitment that we're gonna recruit an additional 220 mentors to help you um, reach the young people in their communities. So we're, we're very excited about that opportunity. This is a new way for mentoring to be recognized um, and to be singled out, if you will, as such an important strategy of choice. We couldn't have had this conversation today without the support of our private funder, Eversource. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's now my honor to introduce my friends and our friends from the Connecticut General Assembly. We have Senator Tony Huang of Fairfield, Representative Brandon McGee from Hartford, Representative Hilda Santiago of Meriden, and Representative Patricia Dillon of New Haven is going to be joining us in a few minutes. I know she is coming in from another meeting. And I can tell you from my time serving alongside these folks that they are some of the most dedicated public servants and their dedication to helping Connecticut's young people is unparalleled. And I just want to thank you on behalf of everyone at the partnership and everyone here today for taking time to be here with us. We know that this is your busy season and that you're willing to take some time to talk with us is just so meaningful. We're also joined by some tremendous community partners. Uh, we have Shirley Ellis West, the executive director of the Urban Community Alliance. We have Jasmine Prezi, who's the director of the Norwalk Mentoring Program with the, New the Norwalk Human Services Council. And we also have two board members from Phenomenal I Am in New Haven, Gakita Robinson and Yvonne Temple. Thank you all for, for being here to talk about mentoring in your communities. These folks are on the front line on a daily basis and you've adapted and evolved through the COVID crisis to make sure that young people in Connecticut continue to have that adult positive connection during this disconnected time. Just to let everyone know what the format of today is gonna to be like, we will have a directed question to each of our participants today so they may all share their unique experience. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end that we can open up questions to those that are in the audience. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to Representative McGee. Do we, I do, am I not seeing Representative McGee on the screen share? So we will, if we don't mind, um, Representative Santiago has been willing to hop in uh, at this moment and we will, just, we will shift to her. So thank you so much for being here this morning, Representative. It's great to see you. Good morning, can you hear me? We can hear you great. Okay, great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here today with this mentoring uh, forum. And it's good to see you again, Kelly. Uh, we still miss you up there at the Capitol. Um, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. But um, I am so honored uh, to be here uh, today to speak about mentoring. Uh, mentoring is where I got to be where I am now. Um, I, was men uh, I was mentored by a woman in Meriden that was very involved in the community, but she was always taking me with her to events, to places, learning how to network. Um, but I, I really started a lot of my advocacy with, uh, with my son who is special needs. And I had to fight for him to get, uh, to get assistance in the, in the school system because they didn't want to give him the help he needed when he was in first grade. Uh, 
And that's how I started my advocacy. That's how I started to meet people. And that's how I met my mentor, who through the years has uh, taken me through uh, a, a way that uh, is to be respectful of people, to treat people with dignity, um, and to also listen to people uh, uh, to make sure that you know where they're coming from. And that's important when you're a mentor and when you're a mentee. Um, so I was able to uh, work with her for many years um, as the first Puerto Rican woman on the city council ever in, in Meriden, I have been able to, um, to, to open the doors for other people of color. The last time we had a person of color, an African-American on the city council in Meriden was in 1972. And I, I became a city councilor in 2005. So that was a long time. Um, but, you know, being able to run for office, being able to stay involved in, in local politics uh, gave me that confidence that I was able to run for a campaign. Now, I ran for other um, positions in Maryland, like the Board of Ed. I ran for the city council in the, in the late 1990s. I lost. It wasn't until my third election that I won uh, the city council seat. Um, but it was the first time in a long time since the 70s that the doors were open for people of color. And we were able to get other uh, city councilors, African-Americans and Latinos on the city council. We have a very large Hispanic population in Meriden, uh, minority population with African-Americans and Latinos in Meriden. Um, so it's important that they have the representation. And that's why uh, I was able to win that seat because I also did a lot of door knocking. I have been, in, I listened to people when they opened the doors. I was, I was able to bring my kids with me um, so that they, you know, if they see you with kids, they open the doors so they want to talk to you. Um, but it's very, very um, fulfilling that I was able to get on the city council and help a lot of people in my community. So, in, in doing that, um, I also became chair of the Human Services Committee, which has all the youth programs in the city of Meriden. So I was able to learn about a, a lot about the youth programs in Meriden and the after school program. So when I became a state rep, uh, we were able to get funding for at risk programs for at risk kids in the city of Meriden, but not only Meriden, but all over the state. We have a Black and Puerto Rican caucus that works closely together. We were able to get the funding. So we were able to uh, get, I, I, with that money that we get in Meriden, we fund 10 youth programs. And some of those, for example, are the Boys and Girls Club, uh, the Ball Heads, uh, which is a new group that I'm just finished uh, uh, funding last year. Uh, uh, there's an autism group, peer pressure, peer mentoring autistic group that also gets funding through the money that I bring to Meriden. So every state rep that is on the Black and Puerto Rican caucus brings money back to their communities to be used uh, for whatever they need to, uh, whatever they see fit that is at risk programs in their, in their communities. So, it, you know, and these programs are to make sure that, um, the after school programs are uh, to keep our kids off the street, to empower them, to, um, to uh, help them to get through whatever they're getting through at home. Uh, we have a beat the street program that does boxing, music, dancing. Uh, and I make sure that I go to these events. I, they, I always get invited. I always go to their events. And cause I want people to see that not only am I you know, helping to bring the funds to Meriden for these youth programs, but that we are also, that I am also involved and interested in what they're doing. Uh, so mentoring has been very, very important to me. Uh, I think that is the gateway uh, to get young people involved, empowered, uh, is the gateway to build new strategies in your community and as a, and as a gateway to having a voice 
to having a seat at the table and being to and be heard by adults and what your needs are, what do you want to see happen in your town, and what do you want to how to go forward to make sure that you are staying off the street, you're staying educated, you're staying engaged. Once you're engaged in your community, then um, you will feel that you are part of the community. And in the city of Meriden, it's mandated for kids to put in uh, 20 hours of uh, community service before they graduate. So we have a lot of kids that are working in different programs in soup kitchens, at the shelter, and other programs in Meriden so that they see how other people live. So um, I think that, you know, mentoring and staying involved in your community uh, is very, very important. So thank you for having me speak for a few minutes and I welcome any questions that come afterwards. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Representative Santiago. We really appreciate you sharing your perspective. And as we know, representation is just so important. And so finding folks who, who look like you in these roles and bringing them along in the process and pulling others along in the process is so important. So thank you so much for your commitment to being able to do that. So we're gonna turn it over now to Shirley Ellis West. Uh, Shirley, I know that the Urban Community Alliance in New Haven is built upon an incredibly strong legacy of advocating for families of color. Um, and you recently went through the merger with VETS and NHFA. Uh, and the VETS mentoring program is really interesting because it has a unique model that matches honorably discharged veterans with at-risk or high-risk youth. And you know, each year, uh, nearly 60% of youth are exposed to violence in their homes, schools, and communities. And of course, that can leave a negative and lasting impact on a child's brain and their cognitive development. So we'd just love to hear from you, Shirley, about your work and how your mentors and caseworkers with the Juvenile Review Board have helped to support um, those youth in your community who may have experienced trauma, and also to hear about how you've been um, supporting reducing recidivism. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so again, um, so I'm happy to be here this morning. I'd like to thank the Governor's Prevention Partnership um, for inviting Urban Community Alliance to participate this morning in your 2021 um, youth mentoring summit, you know, and so, you know, and so I, before I get started talking about, um, you know, the VETS mentoring program and, and the programs, uh, the youth serving programs at Urban Community Alliance, I just too would like to just um, really, really um, reflect a little bit on, you know, what mentoring um, has meant to me in my lifetime. Mentoring, so I think, first of all, I have always seen myself as a as someone who mentors either either um, intentionally or unintentionally, I think that we are all mentors, and wherever we show up and however we present, we are mentoring to somebody. And I can't, you know, I I won't. It, it would take up the whole presentation if I was to really share, like you know, mentoring from from my early stage of life to my later stage of life. And so, but I think that as I as I reflect on the importance of mentoring in my in my life, I think that the the fact that I am the new executive director for um, Urban Community Alliance, which was formerly the New Haven Family Alliance, um, um, that I that I have been employed at for um, about twenty eight years. So the the fact that I am in this position today is a testimony to mentoring in my own um, in my own life. Um, you know, Barbara Tenney, the um, executive, the, the past executive director, was certainly a mentor for me as I as I think about the new leadership role I have in taking Urban Community Alliance into its um, um, the organization into its next phase of existence under Urban Community Alliance. And so I say that to say that so the um, Urban Community Alliance um, is the is the result of a merger between the New Haven Family Alliance and the Vets Mentoring um, Program. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we 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 merged on February the twenty eighth. So it's almost been a year since we have officially been Urban Community Alliance, and I am really excited about um, the leadership role and and being able to. Um, and, and being the leader to, to move the organization for both organizations forward 
under their um under their their legacies. So the vets um the vets mentoring program was the brainchild of Dr. Misa Akbar and um, Dr. Brett Rayford um, around um, somewhere between 2010 and 2011, where they thought where I mean you know, during a time in the New Haven community where um, you know youth were were really challenged. Um, you know, in the community around violence and and just and just um, navigating managing themselves, um, you know, from you know in in schools, um, you know, returning back to the community um, from being um, in 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 um, residential programs and programs where they were actually housed, um, you know, um, from from having some involvement with um, the judicial system. And so they they actually thought about you know what what would be impactful for these young people and they came up with the vets mentoring program where we hire um, military um, military vets to support mentoring relationships for some of our most challenged young people in the community. The vets mentoring program has the capacity to reach young people um, statewide. So my my vet mentors serve young people currently in New Haven, Bridgeport, um, and not this year in Hartford, but um, but for many years we've also served young people in the Hartford area as well. And so we have the capacity to serve statewide. Um, the vet the 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 vets as mentors bring bring a unique um, experience to the to the mentoring relationship where many of them bring their past their experiences of even why they joined the military um, which was to you know which which was which was um, an experience of struggling in communities themselves and joining the mil the military for some of them you will hear them say this saved their lives and so they they come very they come very um, um, equipped to, to to support young people in, in a structured way. Um, they are really committed to um, some of the some of the things that young people are are struggling with around you know whether we understand it or not. That's PTSD related. Um, you know, many of our young people in the community are you know have have experienced trauma. Um, that have really been un, un, unnoticed. Um, and so, you know, they, they really come with, with an attitude and a commitment to serving young people um, in, in, in a way where, you know, they, they meet them where they are. They're not afraid to, um, you know, they're not afraid to go into some of the, the um, environments that, you know, that, that many of us would, you know, would, would kind of, you know, um, think twice about because of risk um, and they most certainly, um, you know, um, um, they most certainly mentor the young people in a way where they are able to be present, they are able to be um, authentic and they are able to be, um, and they are able to share experiences and bring, and bring some insight into what many of them are struggling with. Um, and so the the vets mentor the vet mentors they range um, anywhere from 21 to um, to 50. Some of them are younger, some of them are older, um, which also you know um, mean, mean that they bring different aspects of 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 um, their experiences and and based on their stages of life, um, you know. And so um, I'm I'm really um, excited about the vet mentoring program and, and the, the building capacity, not only, okay, okay, so let me just go back just a second. Currently the vets mentoring program, they are, um, we are funded by CSSD and, and they are serving a population of judicially involved young people. Most recently we received some funding from um, um, Governor's Prevention Partnership where we, um, are now going to um, serve young people under the initiated mentoring. We are really excited about that because one of the things that um, I feel very strongly about in doing this work and understanding the work in the community is that, you know, it's really important to provide support and resources for young people that are, that are systems involved. However, 
Um, the goal is to keep them out of the system. So as much as we can do and as often as we can do it to, um, to, to, pri to provide supports and, and resources that keep them out of the system, then those are the things that I am really um, interested in looking, looking to um, um, for the organization. And so thank you, um, Governor's Prevention Partnership and um, the, um, of the national, um, Miss Natalie, um, thank you, um, because we are going to support young people under, uh, uh, under the initiated mentoring as well. Thank um, you, Shirley. We appreciate, we appreciate you being here with us. And I wanna just, I'm trying to be mindful of the time and I know everyone has such wonderful things to share, but we do have Representative Dylan who joined us from the Appropriations um, Committee and I know she has to head back. So do you mind if we transition over to her? No, no, I do not. Um, because the next part of this was just going to be going into COVID-19 and some of the, the closing stuff. So I'm fine. Good morning, um, Representative Dillon. And, and most certainly I, you know, I, I don't mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And hi, Representative Dillon. It's so good to see you. And you're one of the original champions for mentoring here in Connecticut in the legislature. I just want to make sure everyone knows that in 2014, you championed the creation of the Connecticut Mentoring Fund, which I I know many of the programs that we have here today benefited from. It was a public-private partnership. Uh, there was about a hundred thousand dollar appropriation from the state, and then it was matched by money from um, First Niagara Foundation. And we were able to act as a fiduciary. We had an advisory committee, and we were able to do a competitive um, grant process to get some money back into local mentoring programs. So we so appreciate your support for for that. And I know your constant advocacy for the young people here in Connecticut. But we're really interested to hear from you, Representative, about the best ways that we can advocate for mentoring, um, not just from a funding perspective, but what are the best things that we can do in coming to you and Senator Huang and Representatives McGee and Santiago about sharing the story and making sure that you're all aware that mentoring works and is an effective strategy. Um, good morning, and, and it's really good to see you. And yeah, I'm bopping in and out between several briefings as we all do. Um, but I'm so excited to follow my good friend, Shirley Ellis Wetz, who I believe we serve together either on the town committee or on the board of aldermen, but we're all, we're all friends in many different ways and, and admire the way that we all witness in our own communities. And that's part of what we're talking about, representation, but also witness um, in, in our behavior. Um, the, uh, I, I, think, I think that we would, especially if we can maintain the, um, the public-private aspect and leverage any state dollars. Um, I've heard tremendous goodwill from the legislators um, towards um, trying to do something for our young people. How that all comes together will be an issue. Um, I know that it was a little bit, the mentoring was not an easy sell with the previous administration, um, I, I think the current may, governor may be a little bit more open to it, but I don't know that, uh, to be honest, because he's very dollar conscious. Um, I will say that I, I, re, I remember the programs that participated and they were very positive. And, and one of the ways that we all witness sometimes, especially if you run for office, is the young people who work on your campaign very often become a part of your family and there's been a whole lot of those in my life. And, and I go back to check in on, on high school graduations and college graduations. One is in law school. And um, some of the young people, especially the women, men are always a little more complicated with a woman legislator, I find, as uh, uh, they, they say that we're all part of their village. And, and uh, that made me think because I was talking to one of them on the on the phone the other day. Uh, she's in law school, and a lot of the young people in in even in my own district alone have lost some of the, some of the members of their village, and we don't always know who they are. Um, you could go to a home, and there may be an aunt or a woman who's an elder in a church, or a man who's a retired teacher. Who would, who would be part of the pillars of your life where you would go back and forth. I, I had it when I was a child. Um, it happens in, in urban communities. 
sometimes because we can get back and forth more easily. We're less isolated physically. Um, but we've had a lot of loss in our community from this pandemic. And I feel much more strongly than I did last time about the need to respect that our children, meaning the under <laughs> under 25s, are, are, um, have lost something. They've lost a lot. Um, some of them have lost a sense of hope. Some of them don't feel useful and that's a terrible thing. Um, and they may have lost people that we don't always even know are connected to them. When we look at the obituaries and we see so-and-so has passed and it's a person who's, you know, maybe 84 and belong to a particular church. That person may have been part of the village of many, many young people. And I think we need to think about very positive ways that we can have a whole array of, um, of mentoring programs and other programs as well um, to try to help bring uh, our young people back to that. And, and uh, I think we owe them that much. Well, thank you, Pat. I think that's such a, a representative Dylan, I'm sorry. I think that that's a really important thing to take away is that, um, you know, we all may be mentors and we may not even be aware of those that are in the community who are looking to us in that space. I know that that is something that we've talked about a lot on our team. And it's something that I didn't realize that uh, a babysitter that I have, her father was like, she considers you a mentor. And so uh, you just never know that the impact that you're going to have on the young people in our lives. So Thank you so much for being here with us. And I, I just wanted to now turn it over to the ladies from PIA, Yvonne and Yakita, who are board members. Um, and I know that we've talked a lot about the challenges that mentoring programs have, have faced and are facing. But I think one of the wonderful things about your program specifically is that you're looking to empower young women. And so I'd be interested to hear how has seeing young women leaders um, or how is seeing women leaders, excuse me, rise on the national stage? How has that impacted those that you're mentoring? Good morning. Can everyone hear me, see me? <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. So thank you for allowing us to be here to speak um, and be on behalf of our program and for our executive director. Um, as a board member, it's one thing It's you know, one of the important things is, you know, a part of it is being able to fund the program, but a lot of it is being able to encourage the executive executive director to uh, move things forward. And um, during these times, that's exactly what we were able to do and using um, the spotlight of, you know, a Kamala Harris or um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to pretty much see our students, our girls grow and see the importance of empowerment is um, really, uh, really important. So we believe that, you know, young girls and women, um, so that's both of our, we service young girls between the ages of nine and 18. So that's between, um, you know, our young girls who are in the program and also our mentors who are usually, you know, up to about 35, 40 years old um, who mentor our young ladies. We see the importance of ensuring that they are empowered, inspired, elevated, and have somewhat um, received permission to be their authentic selves. So to rise up to all occasions. Um, so being able to witness uh, Mrs. Kamala Harris, um, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, to be at this point, you'll see us wearing t-shirts, um, you see us to, you know, be more empowered to go out and do the work. Um, VP Kamala Harris has opened doors, not only for, you know, young black girls, but women in general, right? So the way we see ourselves, the things that, you know, sometimes we see ourselves like, all right, I have to stay at this level. There's some, a quote that she um, said, about what her mother told her. She said, my mother had, had a saying, Kamala, you may be the first to many 
things, but make sure you're not the last, right? So this is something that we want to ingrain in our programs, something that we ingrain in our students. Um, another one was, what I want young women and girls to know is you are powerful and your voice matters. And my favorite line is, I eat no for breakfast, right? So that is something that is important, important for girls to understand because, you know, a lot of times you will get a no. Um, I believe, uh, I cannot remember her name from Meriden. Hilda Santiago said she had a few no's, you know, but she kept going, right? So we need more conversations like that. We need more information given to the um, young ladies uh, about pressing on. So if you have a dream, if you have a goal, you have to make sure that you work hard to it. It may not come to you the first time that you try, but you continue to do this. So um, now one of my favorite quotes from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, she says, they'll tell you you're too loud, that you need to wait your turn and ask the right people for permission, do it anyway. Right. So this is again, this is stuff that we have to tell our girls and remind them that, you know, yeah, you are awesome. You are going to do this work or whatever work that you see yourself, whether it's an entrepreneur, um, you know, we have to look at things differently. Right. So we are in COVID. COVID has put a wrench in a lot of things that we are trying to do, but it's important for us to find different ways, find, you know, role models through some free online websites, right? Cause you know, sometimes our funding <laughs> is a little screwed up because of COVID, right? So we just wanna make sure that in everything that we do in PIA is pretty much to ensure that our girls know that they can be anything they want. And we're gonna try to find people in that line to ensure that they get to where they want to be. Um, so Kita, Yakita, would you like to add anything? Um, I would just echo uh, more of what Yvonne has already shared. And I think, you know, the Women on the Rise now is giving our young ladies a sense of hope. Um, you know, like Jan said, that they can do and be anything that they want to be, but then also reminding them, you know, reach back for your fellow sister, reach back for, you know, the next young lady coming forward. So I think uh, with all of these powerful women um, on the rise, I think it's, it, it provides them with, you know, reassurance that, you know, I am phenomenal. I can do anything that I put my mind forward to um, and in a sense of hope and that, you know, we're, we all rock and we're all beautiful. Thank Absolutely. you, ladies. Yes, that and last thing. You know, our program is from Maya Angelou's poem, Phenomenal uh, Woman I Am. So we have to remind them that, hey, you are a woman phenomenally, phenomenally woman you are. So always remember that um, and take that with you. So, okay, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I just realized that yesterday, embarrassingly, that that is where your, your name came from. So uh, it was wonderful to hear that. And I'm excited now to hear from Senator Flying. Um, who was appointed to the governor's workforce council, whose mission is to ensure that Connecticut has a strong workforce. And of course, you know, in all of our work with young people, we are hoping that they're going to thrive later in life um, in the workforce and in their communities. And so I'm really interested after you've had a chance to hear from our program partners, um, where you think we can help play a role in the work that you're doing with the workforce council and how mentoring may be a part of that strategy. Thanks, Kelly, and, and I appreciate the great work you do. And, and the mission that your prevention partnership encompasses is to support and prevent substance misuse and the bullying effect. And, and part of the empowerment is really a, a career path and a sense of where your future is going to be. So um, being part of the Workforce Council, it, it is one of the major commitments, but also being a member of the two-gen uh, uh, workforce uh, initiative is also uh, concert with that. But but to me, mentoring is such a critical part to fulfilling your mission and, and workforce uh, 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 engagement is the fact that mentoring is all about connecting, whether it's at home, your surrounding neighborhood, schools, social activity. When you get people believing in their future, they will invest in their present. And, and I think that's the key operative here is this is not just for any sense of urban communities. It applies to rural communities. It applies to our suburbs. It crosses socioeconomic, racial lines. The bottom line is 
we have to empower our youth with a sense of purpose. And mentoring is such a critical part to allow them to make that connection. And I, I really do believe that because if you don't believe you have a future, you're not going to make the investment to, to the challenges and sacrifices you need to make to succeed. So I, I think what you do and, and this kind of a philosophy is critical to, to connect with people. And that's through education, through engagement, through connection. So I am always happy to support you and the incredible mission you have. And, and I wanna extend my appreciation to all the advocates that are on up and down Main Street that, that are doing the really hard work. And we wanna hear your voice. So uh, I was happy to wait and, and I'm very excited to, to continue to support what you do. Uh, but if everybody will excuse me, I, I probably got to run soon and, and pop into another meeting. And uh, you got a great follow up with uh, Representative McGee. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate Thanks, that. It, we'll definitely be in touch if there's Absolutely. ways that we can help the Workforce Council and the work you're doing. So we appreciate you taking the time this morning. And now uh, we do have Jasmine Prezi, but we're going to she's been gracious enough to turn it over to representative McGee because I know he has a 10 o'clock caucus along with representative Santiago and uh, representative McGee. I feel like it's a homecoming today. You <laughs> yeah. have been with us for so many years on so many different initiatives. We actually um, brought representative McGee down to Washington in 2017 and he was recognized by our national partner mentor for excellence in mentoring because he, um, in addition to being a state legislator, he's also the board chair of Ascend Mentoring in Windsor. Um, um, so, you know, mentoring is in his blood, in his DNA, and I'd just love to hear why mentoring has been one of your chosen platforms to help support positive youth development. Well, um, first and foremost, uh, it's definitely a hard act uh, to follow all of my colleagues, uh, but I'm sure Jasmine will drop the mic uh, once she finishes her presentation. Uh, again, thank you so much, Kelly and Roland and the entire staff at the Governor's Prevention Partnership. Um, you know, just to jump right on in, and I promise um, I, I will be brief. Uh, today's discussion on mentoring is, is, is so needed um, like never before. Uh, we all know the impacts of COVID on our, on our lives. Just think about the young people who had an opportunity to, to interface with those positive role models and um, again, I can't thank the partnership enough uh, for uh, really being nimble and innovative and, and, and taking a step back to engage many of the organizations in a time of need as we considered and reimagine how our programs are, are moving forward to engage our mentors as well as our mentees. Um, my first group of, of mentors uh, were my mom and my dad. Uh, who taught me the importance of education and community. Uh, over the last decade or so, probably even longer, um, I've had the fortunate opportunity uh, to use my influence and my passion uh, to support mentoring efforts in my role as chair of uh, the board of directors for a program called Ascend Mentoring. Um, our mission is really simple. It's, it's to provide a holistic model of mentoring and support services uh, to youth and families um, as they continue to reach their fullest potential. But I wanna end off, and there's, there's so much that I can share with you, but I wanna end off on why mentoring is so important uh, and the impacts it's had on me. Um, I was introduced to other successful African-American leaders from my community uh, that each shared personal testimonies uh, in school uh, and life, which for me had a major impact uh, on my entire journey. Um, two persons in particular, uh, June Archer uh, from Windsor, Connecticut, who is now a motivational speaker and doing some really great things, and my godfather, my pastor, Marichal Muntz. Uh, they both shared with me um, some of their basic principles. Uh, they um, shared that love, commitment, and consistency will take you a long way. Uh, and that was one major impact, just having mentors. Uh, another impact is because of programs like the Prevention uh, Partnership, Career Beginnings, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, and other resources. I'm sure I'll get in trouble later because I didn't mention somebody's organization. Um, 
it afforded me the opportunity to hone in on my interests, uh, which were um, uh, basically to help me draft uh, my school and my career paths. Uh, unlike other organizations, um, you know, like the Career Beginnings, the Boys and Girls Club, my fraternity, wasn't my fraternity then, uh, but they offered me an opportunity. Um, I've been able to do some of the most amazing things in my life because someone took the time to help me stay on the path, uh, head the right way, uh, understand the decisions that I made uh, and the consequences that come along with it. Uh, so now that I'm getting a little older, um, I'm using my influence and my, my skill to support the development of programs throughout the state. Uh, and these types of settings, and I commend y'all for having a virtual space for us to continue what uh, we would do otherwise if we were in person. Um, I will continue to support mentoring programs, uh, especially during these times, um, during this pandemic. And lastly, our organization, the Ascend Mentoring Program, we've launched a new campaign called Don't Sweat the Tech. Uh, there are so many organizations trying to figure out how to provide quality Wi-Fi, um, laptops, the appropriate headphones. Um, and I'm telling people, don't sweat it. We'll make it through it. Um, we know money will help us to do the things that we do, but we also know that our young people are resilient, they're innovative, uh, and we'll get through this. Uh, so again, Kelly, uh, Roland, and the rest of the staff there um, at the Governor's Prevention Partnership, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to just weigh in on an important conversation. Thank you so much, Representative McGee. Um, your words are, are so valued, and I think it's a perfect transition to Jasmine, who, um, and I just found that this story yesterday or the day before, she is the newly appointed director of um, the Norwalk Mentoring Program, which is the oldest school-based mentoring program in the country. We also have the good fortune of having Dr. Susan Weinberger with us, who founded that program, who you're going to hear from in a few minutes. But Jasmine actually went through that program herself. And she was mentored from, was it first grade to 12th grade, Jasmine? I want to make sure I'm not botching it. Okay. And yes. So she had two mentors during that time. And her second mentor, she's still in touch with and has really helped her on her path. And so, um, you know, I believe everything happens for a reason. So I think the timing is perfect and building off of Representative McGee's words and being able to share that experience because you're it, Jasmine. Like you're the dream of someone who's here full circle, um, pay, paying it back in terms of your commitment now and your adult life. So we'd love to hear from you about your experience as a mentored young person and how that brought to you to where you are today. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here um, this morning with you. This is my first one because I'm new. I just started in September, so I'm looking forward to many more. And I love being in rooms like this or virtual rooms like this because we're all here for the same reason. And we don't have to kind of persuade anyone about the importance of mentoring because if you're here, you already know. And we're all champions of it, whether we're on the back end or the front end. So it's just a pleasure. We could talk about mentoring all day as you can see we have to kind of you know stop us because we're just so passionate so um just thank you um for you know being here and as you know just as all of my you know other presenters and colleagues and legislators were saying that as a mentored youth you know your your outcome is so different and I really as I'm sitting here listening and reflecting back as you know as um representative Brandon was saying that my first mentors were my parents. And, you know, I'm fortunate to have two great parents, loving parents, but a lot of children, you know, may not come from that. But it's even more special when a community member cares about you, when that someone that you don't know, who is a stranger at the beginning, you know, takes the time to meet with you. As a mentored youth, I just felt so special that someone cared about me, that someone was committed to me and showed up every week, even if it was just for an hour to make sure I made it. You know, when I first started here and I was looking through all of our um, paperwork and all of our data and one of our students said, my mentor made me feel like I can make it. And I had the same feelings. Um, you know, I, I had a mentor from first grade to eighth grade and I laughed 
and say, I don't know how I was recommended to get a mentor, but I'm so happy that I did. And um, my mentor just really provided confidence in me. I'm at an early age. She made me feel like I mattered. She made me feel like I really can make it as cliche as it may sound, but coming from, you know, Norwalk, Connecticut and a certain part of Norwalk, Connecticut, you know, I was exposed to a lot of things, but having a mentor outside of that community, um, also too, showed you a different way, showed you, and not necessarily just, you know, success and, you know, titles or money, but just a way to be. You know, my mentor helped me through challenges. She helped me um, how to, to, to go through different transitions in life. When, you, when you're first in first grade and 12th grade, you're a completely different person. So we grew up together and she really helped mold me into the person I am with such a given heart. I'm a committed community member and it's just an honor to be here to give back to my community and also to lead this wonderful program into you know new heights. We've been around for 35 years and I'm just excited on what we will continue to do you know, for no walk. We're, we're about 300 mentors in. Um, so it, the more mentors that we get, the more mentees that we can provide this wonderful experience with to have these feelings that I once had, you know, so I, I am now a strong advocate for mentoring, as we're saying, we do it intentionally and unintentionally, you know, um, and I have really gave my life to mentoring to talk about the importance to make sure that other kids in my community have, you know, the same opportunity. So, um, mentoring was just very life-changing. You know, um, I, I was a first generational college student and now I'm, you know, three, three college degrees in. And um, I think, all, you know, not from a boastful point of view, but I believe that I am, you know, the best person to, to, to speak about Norwalk, you know, um, going through the school system, going through the mentoring programs. So I can really resonate with the students that, I'm, you know, I'm connecting mentors with. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And I was just sitting here thinking about my own children. And I hope that, you know, one day they're saying that they had powerful mentors in their lives who made a difference too. So we're, we're running a little over time, but it was well worth it. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do questions from the audience, but we are, you know, here for two days. So if anyone does have questions um, that we can help answer, we'd be happy to do that. Um, so just to let you know where we are in the program, we're going to take a brief break before the pre presenting the Advancing Mentoring for Youth Awards. That will start at 10 right. in this room. Um, the awards are going to be presented by David Shapiro, the CEO of our national partner mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. And just to take a quick minute to, to explain a little bit about why we're doing the awards Taking time to celebrate um, the commitment and success of those on our team is part of the, our new organizational values that we adopted in the fall of 2020. Celebrating, collaborating, and a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion are at the forefront of those values that we are committed to holding our, each other to. And we hope that you'll hold us to those too. Um, they're available on our website in our about section. And we're just thrilled to take a moment today to recognize um, these honorees. And we realize how fortunate we are in Connecticut that we could literally be recognizing every single person in this room for their commitment to advancing um, equity and youth mentoring. We're going to take, so now is the break. Uh, we're going to show you a couple of brief videos during that time, but please feel free to check emails, get up, stretch your legs, um, and look forward to the rest of the morning. Thank you so much for being here with us. I decided to become a mentor because I love helping kids. The important is having a mentor when you find out what these kids do, when you bring a smile to their face, when they're calling you, making them feel important. That's what I like doing. I like making those kids feel important. Cuando le ayudas a una persona joven y la montas a tus hombros, ellos tienen la habilidad de ver más lejos que tú. Es importante ponerlos en un momento donde ellos se sientan aceptados primero. Después que me vean ejerciendo lo que más me gusta, la pasión que tengo es la cocina. Que me vean en mi mejor papel, dirigiendo, enseñando, 
uh, creando, probando, pero más que nada demostrando que en cualquier ambiente donde estés hay una posibilidad mejor de la que tuviste.
So welcome back, everyone. We had a wonderful uh, kickoff and start this morning, and we want to begin to transition now to uh, our 2021 Advancing Mentoring for Youth Awards. Uh, and so it's our pleasure to present uh, these 2021 awards. Uh, these awards are given to individuals who have made major contributions to advancing mentoring here in Connecticut uh, across both the public and private sectors. Um, and this year's awards are Excellence in Mentoring uh, and Mentoring Ambassador. And uh, we have a special guest to tell us a little bit about each award uh, and give us his perspective on this year's uh, National Mentoring Summit. Uh, and here's CEO of Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership, David Shapiro. My name is David Shapiro. I'm the CEO of Mentor, and I'm so pleased to be with you all uh, and to be with the Governor's Prevention Partnership, uh, our great affiliate in Connecticut for the 2021 Connecticut Youth Mentoring Summit. I'm so grateful uh, for the leadership and partnership of Roland and Kelly uh, and for the mentoring team um, of Aristide, uh, Hadia, and Joe uh, and the way they uh, show the commitment and lead and serve the movement uh, every day in Connecticut and provide example beyond. Uh, this year's theme, uh, advancing equity in youth mentoring, uh, obviously uh, just right on par with the times and what relationship, and when we put relationship at the center uh, with rigor, uh, with context, um, with shared power, uh, and with acknowledgement of systems and their need uh, for changing. Uh, to be more equitable right at the center what's possible uh, with human relationship and what a what a group of folks you have to lead you through uh, that effort all of the workshop presenters and then you've got you know Tori and Steve and Brian and Gene uh, who have all uh, been great partners uh, and uh, and leaders yeah, at Mentor and with Mentor and longtime experts like Susan and our other affiliates from our network, like the Mentoring Partnership of Southwestern Pennsylvania, just seems like an incredible summit. And thanks to all of you for spending your time uh, and showing your values of continuous improvement uh, and better delivering uh, for and with our young people in the movement uh, by participating in this summit. Uh, but now we turn to recognition and I get the honor of sort of uh, introducing the segment around the 2021 Advancing Mentoring for Youth Awards. It's amazing at the national level, uh, Connecticut has been fortunate uh, to have so many mentoring greats that we've been able to lift up. Uh, the likes of, you know, State Representative Brandon McKee, uh, who was in the legislative roundtable earlier and was an Excellence in Mentoring Award uh, winner in past years for us. Um, and then uh, we turn our attention right now to two greats, two mentoring legends in Charlene Russell -Tail -A Tucker and uh, Larry Selmick. Um, they've, uh, you know, been recognized nationally by mentor Charlene most recently um, as an honoree for the 2021 Excellence in Mentoring Awards in Public Service for the work she's done um, in the school system and leading in the intersection of students striving and thriving with attendance, with mentoring, interventions and just the rigor and systemic integration uh, that is possible. Larry accepted in 2015 uh, on behalf of Webster Bank. Uh, he has been a leader for a long time through both personal and corporate engagement uh, in mentoring and what that can look like when there's a commitment to quality and to it just pulsing through the culture of a company uh, and their volunteerism and commitment and dollars all lined up to invest in relationships for young people. Um, they just show what it is when we uh, make mentoring a frontline strategy, uh, not a nice to have, but a need to have. And they have inspired people, whether in the realm of public education um, or private sector around the country. Uh, people follow their lead. And that's one of the many reasons other than the well-deserved recognition for lifting them up is to see more and more champions meet the level of excellence and the rarefied air that they have reached in being champions for mentoring. And Larry, of course, we 
wish well on wish you well on your retirement, but it is uh, almost impossible to think of you as retired. My guess is you will get more done in retirement than most people do in their working life. Um, you know, the last year uh, we have seen so many changes uh, and constraints and adaptations. Uh, we've watched uh, employers, we've watched our nonprofit sector, we've watched mentors themselves um, have to make adaptations in their own lives and institutions, but then also uh, figure out how to be a great resource uh, for their children and other people's children. And we've been challenged uh, as a society to think about whether we think of all kids as all our kids. Um, and we've seen people like Charlene and Larry who have always viewed the world that way uh, step up in times like these to make sure we're showing up for young people when they need us most. And that we know our recovery is both economic and social and educational and all bound up in one, no one more important than the other and all intertwined. Um, you know, I know Governor Lamont has added mentoring as an incredibly important uh, type of volunteerism during COVID-19 on the Step Up uh, Connecticut portal. That has a lot to do with the leadership of the Governor's Prevention Partnership and all of your excellence in making mentoring visible and showing how impactful and core it is uh, to getting through this time and beyond, both before the pandemic, during it, and after. Uh, that doesn't just happen by accident. It's truly gratifying to see the governor make that so central, and it's a credit to all of you. Um, you know, we want to just thank the partnership uh, from mentors level nationally for helping to advance the state's ability uh, to plug into virtual mentoring, to make it an early strategy, to lead on it, uh, for dedicating so much time to keeping mentoring going during the pandemic and being there to learn with you and serve you and keep you connected and lead in the movement. Uh, it was an easy time uh, to shrink away. They did not do that. Um, our affiliates showed up as backbones across the country, and the governor's prevention certainly did that in Connecticut with pride and with an example that inspired and showed the way for others. Um, we're so glad to see how this summit was brought together. Uh, so many great minds, so many great programs in the field, and also just showing the wide range of applicability for mentoring um, and the importance of rigor and intention and equity being at the center uh, and the way mentoring can really be a driver uh, for recovery, for justice, for opportunity, uh, for equity, and for the days ahead that we want to see for all our young people and for all of us. Um, I thank you so much. Uh, from mentor standpoint, uh, I thank the Governor's Prevention Partnership. I want to congratulate Larry and Charlene and thank them for just being exemplars of what it looks like uh, to lead and champion this movement and prioritize relationship for young people. Uh, and we'll keep on keeping on together. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of the summit and awards program. Take care. Well, we want to thank David uh, Shapiro from Mentor uh, for joining us today and, and queuing up the award and presenting the award to our two uh, awardees today. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate the work that David and Mentor do uh, to lead the movement nationally, and we're very proud to be a part of that movement uh, here in Connecticut. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to, to introduce our winner uh, for this year's Excellence in Mentoring Award, and she's with us right now, Charlene Russell Tucker. She is definitely a, um, a, a partner, a strong partner, a, a strong advocate of mentoring and has led our state through the Department uh, uh, of Education, State Department of Education, and making sure that students are engaged to the fullest. And uh, Charlene, we're so glad to have you uh, with us. We're blessed. We're blessed here in Connecticut. And so just want to uh, give you the opportunity to, to share your thoughts and, and offer some remarks at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Roland, and certainly, uh, David did uh, just an awesome job uh, in talking about how important this is. Uh, but the, the introduction is wonderful and, and thank you and, and heartwarming uh, to see everyone gathered here today uh, to, for, for this, this uh, summit uh, that you're holding uh, to do such great work uh, to continue to bolster the importance uh, of mentoring uh, in this time. And so I was so honored to have heard 
uh, Roland and Aristide nominated me for this award. And by the way, they kept it a secret from me. Uh, and I was even more grateful to have been chosen as an honoree and to re receive it from Mentor, the National Mentor in Partnership. So again, thanks to David uh, for the great uh, thoughts that he just shared and, and also for this recognition. Uh, but more important than myself though, this shows our work uh, that is being noticed on a national scale. And I think for that, we can all be very proud. And so as an education leader, part of my life's work involves, uh, as Roland, as you mentioned, implementing efforts to improve students' attendance, their engagement and achievement, and promoting the role of mentoring as a key strategy. So it's not only comforting, but empowering to know that as evidenced by all of you attending this summit, that clearly I'm far from being alone in this. And indeed what I'm calling this movement has champions in organizations like the Governors Prevention Partnership for men like mentor and of course in all of you. So with the goal of equity and opportunity for all our young people, a goal that is so critically important now as we experience this pandemic, we must continue to attract mentors, to connect them to mentees and to showcase, which I know you've been doing through this summit, the immense positive influence that these relationships bestow upon success and academic engagement in our youth. So I can't end without sharing a sobering fact. Uh, as an educator, we know this is a Connecticut data that attendance both in remote and in-person learning models is significantly lower for some of our student groups, including students who are experiencing homelessness or students with disabilities or kindergartners or English learners. So this is a continued call to action, knowing that mentoring can make a positive impact. So in closing, I thank you all for your hard work and dedication for this recognition, uh, so heartfelt. Uh, your hard work and dedication, especially during these times, and I thank again the Governors Prevention Partnership for bringing us all together in this important cause. Thank you, Roland. Well, thank you, Charlene, and congratulations again. And we certainly appreciate the partnership uh, that we have uh, together in moving this work forward. Um, I'd like to uh, just pause for a moment before we um, uh, recognize our, our second awardee at the Governors Prevention Partnership. Uh, we do have two of our board members here with us today, and we're very pleased that uh, Donna Collins is with us uh, from the Board of Directors, and also uh, Andrea Williams have joined us uh, from our Board of Directors, and we really appreciate their presence today here with us and their commitment uh, to our organization. Um, and so just Larry Selnick, our uh, Mentoring Ambassador Award. Uh, Larry has, uh, is a former board member of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. And um, many, many years ago when the partnership decided to take uh, mentoring on as one of our key strategies, Larry was extremely instrumental. Uh, he is a, a strong ambassador of mentoring throughout all of New England. And here to share a little bit about, well, Larry, you know, he's retired, but do not be surprised if Larry calls on you at any given time because he's an adjunct professor at Southern Connecticut State University. He's already called on me uh, to come to one of his classes. So don't be surprised if he calls on you, right? He's, he's never taken a rest. And so we're very glad that, uh, Larry, we have some, uh, a special guest with us today, Dr. Susan Weinberger, who is gonna share and present uh, the Mentoring Ambassador Award. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Larry. Um, my dear Larry, I am thrilled to be invited to participate in this special presentation in your honor. I vividly remember 2002, that was 19 years ago, and in your role as head of the Diversity Committee at Webster Bank, you identified the importance and power of mentoring for young people. Your idea was to recruit Webster Bank employees as mentors for kids in our state. And I was brought in as a consultant to the Governor's Prevention Partnership to help. Oh dear, Larry, you had your ideas about how you thought mentoring should work. And, and I had mine. The first two meetings were rather contentious and I finally looked at you and said, Mr. Selnick, you are the banking expert. I'm the mentoring guru. If this is going to work, listen to me. And the rest is history. You listened. 
you learned and you took mentoring to great heights at Webster Bank. You walked the walk. You became a mentor yourself more than once. You pioneered an online application system for corporate mentors that truly was revolutionary. You spoke passionately about mentoring at state and national events. You even traveled with me. Can you aye, aye, aye. That to upstate New York to convince other companies to follow your lead? And guess what? They did. After passing the baton in 2008, you were deemed the chairman emeritus of mentoring at Webster Bank. You always wear your mentoring tie whenever you present about the importance of mentoring. Not today, I see, but that's okay because we're on a casual Zoom. I am in awe of your indefatigable belief in mentoring, but beyond all those accomplishments, I am grateful to call you my friend. It's not what we have in life, but who we have in life that really matters. And so I have a special place for you that's reserved in my life and in my heart. And I congratulate you today. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, everybody. This is a little overwhelming. So let me start with some thank yous. Um, you know, this, first off, Roland Kelly, what you have changed in the organization in a short period of time under your leadership has brought me back into the fold and the family. And I'm so pleased to be part and still part of the Governor's Prevention Partnership. And I know Kathy Luria from Webster is on, and she is the person who makes things happen for mentoring at Webster. And Ryan, who now has followed myself and Liz and Kathy on the board, serves and represents the bank. And, and Jay, who runs the leadership, the mentorship program at Webster. You know, we, we just talked as of today, um, we stay in touch because it's become part of our community. And I, I can't say enough about uh, Dave uh, Shapiro, who I knew at Mass Mentoring, and then Lily, who took a spot. They even got me to run a road race to do fundraising for them. You have to be committed to it. And then there's Susan, Dr. Mentor, who has been my mentor in this process, in this program. And yes, I chose to wear my Webster mentoring uh, sweater because it'll be the last time I get to wear it but my uh, Norwalk uh, mentoring tie is on the wall with all the pictures of my son that I can see in front of me and family. Um, so it has a special place there for sure. So let, let me be clear. And I'm going to start with, you know, congratulating Charlene. She said something that was so important, which is, you know, it's our work. And clearly when I was on the board, we focused on workplace uh, environment, providing tomorrow's employees today. But that has grown and changed for myself and I think all of us. It's about investing in our community. And, you know, if there's a message for me to share with anybody here is that, yes, it's important to recruit mentors. And if there's anybody there that wants uh, a business uh, person uh, to help you talk to a business about why they should allow their employees to do mentoring, call me. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me through, through Kelly and Rowling. I am happy to do that uh, as schedules allow for sure. But more importantly, I think the thing I learned the most, and this was from Susan and Roland and so many others, was how important that partnership is with the school. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to get the superintendent to buy in. Yes, you have to get the principal to buy in. And I've been mentoring at Chapman Elementary in Cheshire for over 17 years. I know how important that is. But the key is the teacher and the teacher-parent relationship and how they bring you into that family of the classroom and understanding what you can play. And then most important is the person who's designated the coordinator. She or he has so much influence as to what makes it successful. And they need to be taught and trained about mentoring as well so they can be advocates. So if there's opportunity to support programs, train the trainers at the schools and make them understand the value that they get. Because I think any business will want to send their employees there if they know it'll be a successful uh, engagement and a welcome place. And I certainly have feel, feel the welcome. And I still, I moved. I don't live in Cheshire anymore. I drive an hour uh, when I go there. And um, right now I'm doing virtual and I look forward to staying with my mentee who I've known since first grade. And on he goes on the middle school. And, but I'm in Milford. So if anybody wants to talk about mentoring there, we can do that. So let me end with um, 
thank you for allowing me to be part of this organization and allowing me to participate in programs like the Norwalk program. Jasmine, great job on your notes today and loved emailing back and forth with you. And to the rest of you, uh, I'm not retiring. I just left work full time. So I'm still around and watch out. Roland's right. You will get a call to come guest lecture for sure. Thank you. Well, well, congratulations again, Larry. Congratulations to you uh, and, and Charlene. And you both represent the best of public-private partnerships for the cause of strengthening youth mentoring. And we so appreciate the, the contributions and your leadership, the work that you all do. Um, and so it's well-deserved. And so we're, we really appreciate you both. Uh, now it's time for us to, um, to think about transitioning uh, into a different Zoom room at 1045. Uh, we will start our keynote presentation. Um, don't worry, it'll be open momentarily. Uh, you will be asked again to uh, give your name and email address uh, as you enter that room. Uh, we should be dropping the link into the chat shortly. Uh, and if you click on that link, it will bring you to the next room, uh, which will feature our keynote uh, for today's session. Um, you can also visit us on the website, again, the day one under the heading of day one on our website uh, for this summit at preventionworksct.org forward slash day one. And you'll be able to register or just sign in, log into the Zoom room uh, for the keynote as well. Uh, and of course, there's much more to come after the keynote. We've got some breakout sessions. Uh, that will occur this afternoon. Remember now, we said we have over 40 presenters and speakers for this two-day conference, uh, for this two-day summit that uh, we're engaged in. And so I also would like to, um, we, I, I noticed one of our other board members joined us, Ryan McElhenney, uh from, from Webster. Uh, he's with us here today. And I saw him put a post in the chat room of congratulations to Larry. So Ryan, we're glad to have you here with us joining us today as well. So if there's no further um, housekeeping for uh, this first segment of our time together, uh, we do have a little break and we will see you in the new Zoom room, the next Zoom room for our keynote uh, presentation. Thank you all so much. <laughs>